things might not be over for the YF-23 even after being rejected by the U.S. Air Force years ago. Despite not being chosen, the aircraft remains top-notch and could be a viable option for countries restricted from purchasing the YF-22. One such country is Japan, which is currently searching for a new fighter. In 1991, the U.S. Air Force staged a competition between the Lockheed YF-22 and the Northrop McDonnell Douglas YF-23 demonstration fighters. The YF-22 emerged victorious and was developed into the highly successful YF-22A Raptor. However, the question remains. Is the YF-22 still the best aircraft, or can the YF-23 make a comeback and compete with it once again? Join us as we unveil how Japan brings back to life the modernized YF-23. Japan relies heavily on its fleet of fighter jets to maintain its national defense. With over 200 F-15J fighters, Tokyo boasts the largest F-15 fleet outside the U.S. Air Force. However, Japan's F-15 fleet is one of the oldest, and the country was forced to consider alternatives when a 1998 American law restricted the export of the F-22 Raptor, which the government had hoped to use as a replacement. Japan initially attempted to develop a domestic technology demonstrator called ATDX, but the project proved too costly to pursue alone. Consequently, Japan is now seeking outside assistance to accelerate the development of a new fighter jet, aiming to replace its aging F-15 fleet as soon as possible. In the 1980s, the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a high-stakes race to the finish line of the Cold War. The jets that the Air Force operated at the time, including the F-14 Tomcat and the F-15 Eagle, were still in the prime of their operational service. Still, new Soviet fourth-generation fighters such as the Sukhoi Su-27 and the Mikoyan MiG-29 were proving adept as direct competitors to U.S. aircraft. The Air Force wanted something better, and to find it, they held a contest among defense contractors called the Advanced Tactical Fighter ATF, competition. After the U.S. Air Force requested an advanced tactical fighter, almost all major aircraft manufacturers in the United States put forth their proposals. Among them, Lockheed Martin, a prominent defense contractor and the developer of advanced warplanes like the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, was the first to respond. They offered a unique hybrid design, combining the features of both these fighter jets. Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman competed in the Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition in the early 1990s. In a fly-off between Lockmart's YF-22 and Northrop's YF-23, the YF-22 emerged as the winner and was subsequently named the YF-22 Raptor. Despite being one of the largest aviation companies globally, Northrop lagged behind as it had not designed and built a fighter since the YF-23. Instead, the company focused on drones, especially the RQ-4 Global Hawk and bombers, such as the B-2 Spirit and the upcoming B-21 Raider. However, Northrop Grumman is already known for its mastery in combat aircraft technology, from system and air vehicle design to flight controls, vehicle management systems, network-enabling technologies, and survivability. Therefore, Japan's need for this technology is critical, and Northrop, the developer of the B-21 Raider bomber, will have access to this latest stealth technology, making it an ideal partner. Although the company teased an image of a tailless sixth-generation fighter in a promotional video in 2016, developing a new airframe may not be feasible given time and money constraints. During the face-off between the Lockheed YF-22A and the Northrop YF-23, the latter earned the nickname Black Widow 2 because of its stealth features. The YF-23 Black Widow 2 was a marvel of engineering, measuring 67.4 feet in length, 43.6 feet in wingspan, and 13.10 feet in height. The fighter weighed 29,000 pounds when empty and had an MTOW of 62,000 pounds. It could reach a maximum speed of Mach 2.2 
and Mach 1.6 on the supercruise and had an impressive range of almost 3,000 miles with a service ceiling of 65,000 feet. The combat radius was around 800 miles. This YF-23 design shows the use of thrust vectoring and recessed weapons carriage in the lower fuselage. The curvy, low-profile YF-23 starkly contrasted the sharp edges of the YF-22 and featured a wide, almost pancake-like airframe structure with blended wing elements. The pilot sat within the forward section of the fuselage and was given access to a completely digital, then ultra-modern cockpit offering relatively excellent vision. The intakes to aspirate the twin-engine arrangement were positioned along the underside of the fuselage. The twin tail was outward canted and straddled the thrust vectoring engine outlets. No horizontal tailplanes were featured. The new designs of the YF-23 combined stealth and high maneuverability with a long-range supercruise capability, making it an ideal aircraft for survival in the current air combat environment. Four generations of stealth had preceded the design concepts for this aircraft, and it needed to prevent detection from radio transmissions, heat from the engines, and other forms of energy detectable by specialized ground sensors. The concept of an advanced tactical fighter, ATF, dates back to 1971 during early studies of using stealth to design a modern fighter aircraft. Over the next decade, the U.S. Air Force's Tactical Air Command TAC, and other commands began to refine the requirements of the next generation of fighter aircraft. Despite limited and sporadic funding for these studies, most major aircraft manufacturers produced design concepts for the ATF. In mid-1981, the Air Force released a formal request for information, RRFI, to the leading aircraft companies. Each company absorbed the cost of these one-year studies, as no government funding was available for them. The RFI was sent to nine companies, Boeing, Fairchild Republic, North American Rockwell, General Dynamics, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Grumman, Vought, and Northrop. Seven of these companies chose to participate, submitting 19 concepts. Vought and Fairchild Republic, however, decided not to participate. The 19 design concepts differed considerably in size, shape, and maneuverability. As the studies progressed, the design parameters were refined from reduced RCS to low observability, including supercruise capability, advanced avionics and radar, and high maneuverability. Each company's concept incorporated some features that would eventually be included in the design for the ATF. Winners of the competition were announced on October 31 of 1986, with Lockheed and Northrop coming out on top. Instead of five losers, each prime contractor teamed up with another member from the competition. Northrop teamed up with McDonnell Douglas, while Lockheed teamed up with Boeing. The new aircraft received the designations of YF-22 for Lockheed's design and YF-23 for Northrop's. Lockheed and Northrop used the prevailing years to refine their designs for the ATF so that by the time the selection was made, the ATF designs for each company had evolved into a vehicle that closely matched those built. Along with airframe designs, two engine manufacturers were chosen to compete in the ATF competition. Pratt and Whitney entered with their YF-119 PW100 design and General Electric went with the YF-120 GE-100. One ATF prototype from each company would be powered using engines from each manufacturer. The first YF-22 and second YF-23 received GE engines, while the second YF-22 and first YF-23 received Pratt and Whitney power plants. Construction began almost immediately to meet the tight deadlines for the competition. Northrop was the first to unveil their prototype in a rollout ceremony held at Edwards AFB on June 22, 1990. Northrop began engine runs the following month, and the YF-23 moved under power for the first time on July 7. The YF-23 rapidly completed taxi testing with increasing speeds, culminating in the final high-speed test to 120 knots on August 11. Unofficially dubbed Black Widow 2, Northrop's prototype air vehicle, 
PAV No. 1 took to the air for the first time on August 27, making a near-flawless one-hour flight. Climb-out was brisk, requiring the F-16 chase to use an afterburner to stay with the YF-23 using military, non-afterburning thrust. Northrop test pilot Paul Metz stated the aircraft was abnormally solid yet agile, requiring few pilot stick motions to remain in tight formation with its safety chase aircraft. Lockheed unveiled their YF-22 prototype the following day in a ceremony held at Plant 10 in Palmdale, California on August 28. With the first flight completed, flight testing ramped up quickly. Similarly, to maximize time aloft, the YF-23 qualified for air refueling on its fourth flight. Flying behind a KC-135 tanker, the YF-23 spent nearly three hours performing hookups and disconnects at various airspeeds and throughout the tanker's boom envelope. Flight number five saw the YF-23 fly supersonic for the first time under McDonnell Douglas's test pilot, Bill Lowe. Afterwards, the aircraft began testing supercruise speeds out to Mach number 1.5. By flight number six, the first four YF-23 pilots received checkout, with the final pilot check coming with the program's operational test pilot, Con Thusen, on flight number 11. Also, PAV-2 was added to the flight program on October 26, 1990, and Jim Sandberg piloted the GE-powered aircraft on its first flight. Initially, PAV-1 testing proceeded smoothly until Bill Lowe experienced a shattered forward windscreen at Mach 1.5 during flight number 16 on October 30. Fortunately, the inner polycarbonate layer of the windshield remained intact, allowing for a safe landing. The same scenario repeated on PAV-2 nearly a month later. PAV-2's early flights were challenging. During its second flight, the left engine entered a sub-idle condition and wouldn't accelerate, leading to an uneventful single-engine landing. On November 21, during flight number three, a plugged air sense line caused the fuel tanks to overpressurize, putting the aircraft at risk. As the plane climbed in altitude, the internal pressures reached the structural limits of the fuel tanks, but quick action by the ground control room helped get the aircraft on the ground safely. Despite these incidents, PAV-2 became a reliable test aircraft. Both air vehicles flew together only once during the test program, when Paul Metz in PAV-1 and Jim Sandberg in PAV-2 flew formation over the Mojave Desert on November 29. PAV-1 ended its flight testing career the following day with a six-flight surge and flutter test out to Mach 1.8, the highest speed attained by PAV-1. Unfortunately, PAV-1's flight test program lasted only 93 days, and all efforts were concentrated on expanding the supercruise envelope with PAV-2. PAV-2's max supercruise speed has never been publicly released, but it is stated to have been significantly faster than PAV-1. With funding running out, PAV-2 continued flight testing, and on the next to last flight of PAV-2, a 15-minute formation with the first YF-20 occurred on December 18, the only time the two different prototypes flew together. The program's final flight came during the second flight on December 18, when Ron Taco Johnston piloted PAV-2 on a nearly two hours test mission. PAV-2's flight testing lasted a mere 82 days. Both aircraft were placed in flyable storage, awaiting the decision on a winner of the ATF program. PAV-1 moved under power only three more times in January, February, and March 1991 during slow-speed taxi runs to keep the aircraft in flyable condition. The Air Force spent the first four months of 1991 evaluating the two airframe and engine proposals. On April 23, 1991, Secretary of the Air Force Donald Rice announced that the Lockheed F-22 and Pratt and Whitney F-119 won the competition for the ATF production contract. Secretary Rice's announcement stated that both aircraft met the requirements for the ATF, but the USAF had more confidence in Lockheed and Pratt and Whitney to manage the program to deliver the weapon system on time and at cost. After the ATF's decision, 
Both PAVs were stripped of all government-provided equipment, including avionics and engines. They were subsequently placed in outdoor storage in a small fenced area next to the B-2 test facility at Edwards AFB. Despite sitting in storage for almost two years, NASA was eventually given ownership of both PAVs on December 1, 1993. While NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center initially proposed doing structural testing of composite airframes, no funds were ever allocated for the project, and both vehicles remained in outdoor storage in different locations around the center. Approximately 18 months after NASA acquired the YF-23s, they realized no testing would be done. As a result, they offered the airframes to museums. Ownership of PAV-1 was transferred to the National Museum of the United States Air Force, and the vehicle was moved to the AFFTC Museum at Edwards AFB in May 1995 for temporary display. So, in August of the same year, PAV-2 was disassembled and transported to the Western Museum of Flight, initially located in Hawthorne, California, but later moved to Torrance, California. Finally, in 2000, PAV-1, disassembled and transported via C-5 Galaxy, was sent to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, where it is now on display. However, one element of the development phase of the competition was to evaluate two experimental turbofan engines, the Pratt and Whitney YF-119 and the General Electric YF-120. As such, each YF-23 prototype was designated PAV-1 and carried YF-119 engines and the second prototype, PAV-2, was fitted with a YF-120 engine. However, the YF-119 eventually won out over the YF-120 and went on to power the F-22 Raptor fighter service. It's interesting to consider why the YF-22 was ultimately chosen over the YF-23 given that both planes are highly advanced tactical fighters. According to Bill Sweetman's 1991 compilation of the YF-22 and YF-23 specifications, the YF-23 boasts a superior thrust-to-weight ratio of 1 point underscore 36, while the F-22's ratio is much lower, at 1.08. This ratio impacts acceleration, takeoff speed, and maneuverability during flight which are critical factors in combat situations. The thrust-to-weight ratio determines a fighter's ability to quickly reposition, evade enemy fire, and engage the enemy effectively. The YF-23 and YF-22 can reach speeds of Mach 2.25, but the F-22 can achieve a supercruise speed over Mach 1.8, compared to the YF-23's speed of 1.6. Supercruise speed is crucial, as it allows pilots to spend more time on targets and maneuver for extended periods without using afterburners. Therefore, the YF-22's superior supercruise speed was likely the deciding factor in its selection. Multiple articles comparing the YF-22 and YF-23 aircraft suggest that the YF-22 was more agile and maneuverable despite its lower thrust-to-weight ratio. The YF-22 excellent air-to-air -air maneuverability and agility may have played an essential role in its selection. Some people claim that the YF-23 has superior stealth capabilities, but a closer examination of the airframes raises doubts about this claim. The degree of thermal signature management, radar absorbent cladding materials, internal weapons, bay configuration, hard spots, and an internally buried engine may make it difficult to determine which aircraft is more stealthy. Determining the stealthiest aircraft can only be achieved through comprehensive testing and evaluation. However, examining the airframes indicates that the YF-22 is more stealthy. Its body and wings are more homogeneous and follow a horizontal fuselage design. In contrast, the YF-23's twin-engine exhaust appears more angular and jagged, with two protruding or raised engine exhaust jets. Even though the U.S. Air Force chose the YF-22, future aviation analysts may still question this decision. As many variables were considered, there will always be speculation about which of the two aircraft performed better. Nevertheless, 
The YF-22 is now widely regarded by observers and advocates as the most dominant air supremacy platform ever to exist. The most significant difference between the two planes, however, was in their sharply differing appearances. While the YF-23 appeared similar to existing Lockheed designs, the YF-23's wings resembled a diamond with a smaller profile than the YF-22. Two YF-23 prototypes were ultimately built. Each was equipped with in-flight refueling capabilities and a weapon bay that could have held four AIM-120 missiles. If the aircraft had gone into production, it could have also been equipped with a 20mm Vulcan cannon and an additional weapon bay for Sidewinder missiles. After evaluating both aircraft prototypes, the Air Force ultimately chose the YF-22 over the YF-23. The YF-22 was later developed into the F-22 Raptor, which has been recognized by many as the best fighter aircraft in the world. Meanwhile, the two YF-23 prototypes were sent to museums, one to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, and the other to the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance, California. One possible reason why the Air Force chose the YF-22 over the YF-23 was that Lockheed, who designed the YF-22, seemed more capable of managing the fighter program than Northrop, who designed the YF-23. As the Cold War ended and the defense budget decreased, the Air Force knew it had to manage the program well if it wanted Congress to fund a fighter with no longer a clear opponent. Another reason the YF-22 won is marketing. Lockheed put the YF-22 through a vigorous flight test schedule that showed off the fighter's dogfighting abilities, including an angle of attack of 60 degrees and sharp turns that pushed the limits of human endurance. While the YF-23 was likely as maneuverable as its competitor, Northrop didn't go out of its way to demonstrate that it could. The U.S. does not necessarily miss an opportunity in not picking the YF-23, as in the long run, it may not matter much. Both were excellent fighters, and the YF-22 has had a perfect run. However, the YF-23 could have been a fiscal disaster, or Northrop would have done better than Lockheed, but we never really know. In the meantime, there has yet to be a situation where the YF-22 has come up short in ways the YF-23 would have not. The two companies will likely compete again, this time to build the Raptor's replacement as Japan brings back to life modernized YF-23. Northrop Grumman has also shaken off some old demons to win, as it will be a stiff competitor once again. Thanks for watching. While you're still here, click on the link on your screen to watch another of our interesting videos. See you there.